Hey, it's it's been an amazing time together already, and I'm really excited that a friend of mine and coworker is joining us tonight to continue this series of technical. I, one of the things I love about Yam is we're not so polished here, right? We can make mistakes. It's a safe place, and we just get to lift up praises to Jesus. But it's not about anybody's performance; it's about our hearts. And so last week we started a, a series of conversations that we're calling A Better Story About Love. And we're looking at what Jesus teaches us about how to really love each other in a way that's different than maybe we learn from this world. And I'm really excited for my friend and coworker Megan to join us. So we give Megan a hand. Hey, guys. And she's going to be opening up God's Word and sharing a little bit of her story with us tonight. So some of you who went on the retreat, you might have remember meeting her there. And if you're new to the community, we have a mini retreat coming up soon. But I'll talk about that more later. So with that, Megan, have some fun. All right. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. Well, hey guys, uh, like Corey said, I am Megan. I work in student ministry here at Hope, and I'm just really excited to be here tonight. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I just want to tell you all, God has blessed me and my husband with three amazing daughters. And since we have daughters and not sons, we actually didn't experience a broken bone until my eldest was 10 years old. And um, <laughs> you might laugh, but the bone he broke was her index finger. Okay. So I know some of you are like, Megan, does that even Like it's a finger? It does. Okay. There was like real tears, real pain. Um, so much that we got her right in the car and we drove her over to the orthopedic doctor. And he started taking x-rays and I was all mama bear. I'm worked up. This is my baby here. And she had been crying in the car. I'm looking at her fingers just getting the minute it's it's kind of black and blue and I'm like is she gonna have like a jacked up finger forever like is it gonna look crazy and I look over her at her in the moment and she is calm cool and collective and I'm like is this even my kid and and then in all all reality they start splitting her up and she's still calm cool and collective I think I've got a picture of her um this was about two years ago it's during COVID so it's super fun as well but there's up and like look at her. She's just like, yeah, whatever. Um, and then we get to the car and I'm like, girl, how are you so composed? How are you so put together? And she told me, well, mom, honestly, I just felt God in that moment. I just felt a complete peace. So had Emma not experienced that pain, had she have not went through that, there wouldn't have been a blessing, which was her experiencing God during that scary time. And, and that experience, it showed me that we find our identity in Jesus when we think all is broken, when we think everything is rock bottom. And that's exactly what I want to speak to you tonight on. I want to speak to you on the subject of a blessing in the brokenness. Someone say a blessing in the brokenness. Oh, and I got one more picture too with all the hair stuff I forgot. There she is a few weeks later in her cute little, she doesn't wear these anymore because now she's too cool, but in these little Wonder Woman pajamas, they went down to her sister because, yes, we do hand-me-downs. And um, she's got green on her splint because green is her favorite color. So, no, we're not there yet. Okay. So um, at Hope, especially in student ministry where I work, we talk a lot about being able to teach in a balance of truth and of grace. And I think naturally we lean a little bit more one side to the other. Like by a show of hands, how many of you grew up in a church that um, focused a lot on truth all the time? The fact that we are kind of all sinners and that sin is really bad and that God, he's, he's kind of like this distant landlord and he's so angry at us about our sin that he actually wants to kill us but instead he killed Jesus. And, and, and maybe you left every Sunday feeling a little bit beat up, feeling a little bit shamed about your past with very little knowledge of how to move forward in your sin and get restoration with God. Anyone been there before? Okay. And on the contrary, many of you may have grown up in a church that focused on grace all the time. And, and you know, we're loved by God no matter what because God is, is love. And maybe you view Jesus as just this, like, long-haired hippie dude that, that wore some Birkenstocks and he walked around Jerusalem saying things like peace and, and shalom. And, and you left every Sunday thinking, you know what, <laughs> sin, it really isn't that big of a deal. Like, that's what the cross was for. 
Uh, but the problem with both of those views, guys, is the Bible. And, and that's because the Bible actually marries those two ideas together, and it does it like this. His grace is the answer to overcome sin because the power of God's grace is transforming. His grace is able to transform our lives as individuals and in the relationships that we have around us. And the passage that we're going to look at tonight is going to show us just that. As we read over this passage, though, I want you to remember the title of our message. There is a blessing in the brokenness. So we're going to be in the book of John tonight, and we're going to be in chapter 8. And to give you a little context here, Jesus, he's making an appearance in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. Because you see, every Jewish male who is 21 and over, they were required to go to Jerusalem for three Jewish festivals a year. We have Passover, Pentecost, and the Tabernacle. So he's here, and his presence in Jerusalem is contentious. It's controversial to the religious leaders. If you remember in some of the Gospels, we see the religious leaders, they don't like Jesus, right? They, they actually, in this chapter, want to devise a plan so that they can get rid of him because they want nothing more than to prove he, he's not the Messiah and to kick him to the curb. So we're going to start in chapter 8. We're going to read the first two verses. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. So what we have here is, is during the festival, Jesus would sleep on the Mount of Olives, and then he would come back in the temple court that day to teach. So he sits down to teach, and this is where the Pharisees and the scribes, these holier-than-thou kind of people, they come in, and they're going to spring the trap on him. So we're going to pick up in verse 3. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. And I forgot that. Sorry. There we go. They literally drag this woman in. They have her stand in front of Jesus, this big crowd. And that phrase, caught in the act of adultery, it suggests that the man, the men literally pulled her away from the very act of adultery. So imagine this with me for a minute. We've got this woman. She's made to stand before Jesus and a large crowd as they expose her sin, the humiliation right? The embarrassment, the shame. No one should feel that. My heart's already breaking for this woman. She's being dehumanized. Now, ladies in the room, I have a question for you. Who's missing from the scene? Yeah, yeah, the gentleman, right? The, the, the guy. It takes two to tango, if you know what I'm saying, right? And this dude is nowhere in sight. So this leads me to believe that this guy wasn't a stand-up gentleman, right? He's not, like, bringing her flowers. He's not opening the car door for her. And in biblical times, adultery was a major, major offense. If you were caught in adultery, you were to be stoned to death by the Mosaic Law. So here is the kicker, though. Under the Mosaic Law, it says both parties both parties who are doing the tango, they're to be put to death. We see this in Deuteronomy 22.22. It says, if a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. In this way, you will purge Israel from such evil. We see it reiterated in Leviticus 20.10. If a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man and the woman who've committed adultery must be put to death. So remember, we said this was a plan. It was a plan to discredit, to get rid of Jesus. So my mind already thinks, well, this joker, this dude, he was in cahoots with the religious leaders trying to entrap Jesus. And in fact, John goes on to confirm all this is a trap. It's all a ruse in the next few verses. So we're going to keep reading on. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. So remember, this is, this is a setup. This man who tangoed with this woman, he was like, you know what? Kind of lacks some boundaries. I, I don't really have a lot of morals. This, this kind of sounds fun. I'm in. But it's heartbreaking. We have a group of men who are religious leaders, and they want to discredit Jesus so bad that they're willing to exploit and de demean this woman. Now, I don't want you to hear me wrong. 
this woman, she's not like Miss Innocent. She's not going around the temple, you know, praying hymns and wearing a chastity belt. She's 100% responsible for her actions in this adulterous relationship. But for religious leaders to shame and humiliate to get what they want, it's just, it's honestly pretty sick. So Jesus, he's at a crossroads. If he says, well, let her go, then he's going to violate the law of Moses. And he's going to fall right into their trap. And I can just see it now. The religious leaders are going to be like, <laughs> really? Like, like Jesus, you, you said you were the son of God, but you're violating the very law that you wrote. And if he says, well, we'll kill her, you know, that's the law. It's going to go against his reputation of the Messiah being one who would bring grace and mercy and love. And he could also get in trouble with the Romans because they might view it as an overstepping of his authority. Because Jewish people could not legally put someone to death in, in Rome without Rome's approval. So, WWJD, what is Jesus going to do? So the text tells us that Jesus, he stoops down, and he actually starts writing with his finger in the dirt. And the Greek verb here, to write, isn't used, actually. It's a compound word that means to record. So Jesus, what's he recording? Scriptures don't tell us. But I do have a hunch. I believe he's writing the sins of the religious leaders, the ones that they thought no one would see, the ones that they thought were behind closed doors doors. They didn't realize that they were standing before God who knew every sin that they had ever committed. So Jesus, he, he stands up and he says, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. So he's like, you know what? Okay, we're going to follow the law, but there's one caveat to it. The one without sin can throw the first stone. So he stoops back down and he starts writing in the dust again. Like, it's a mic drop moment. Like, Jesus, he's always, every time in the Gospels, he's just always, like, amazing me with his, his kind of thoughts and his, his motives behind things. So I can just imagine the religious leaders in the crowd. They just have, like, a weight of conviction over them. It gets hit them like a ton of bricks. They think, well, man, I just, I, I just actually lusted over to that woman on my right, and, and I lied to my family about where I've been going because we've all sinned. And we all deserve the judgment of God. We, we all deserve the stone, but that's not what we want. We want grace. The problem is we just don't want grace for others. We have this grace for me, but justice for you mentality. And I think I know it often well because at my home, that's a lot of, of what goes on with my girls, um, especially when they were real little. I remember this one time, they were all sick, which they're currently sick too. I'm kind of fighting it myself. Um, but they were sick, and I had taken them to the doctors. And my older two had a really streppy-looking throat. And so we get into the, the, the office, and we're like, we're going to run a strep test. And uh, the nurse comes back with a large Q-tip. And she looks at, at the time, my oldest that you saw in the picture, she would have been six at the time. She looks at her, and she's like, well, we're just going to, you know, put this down your throat. And... I was like, no, you're not. And so she's, she's just losing her mind, and she's really begging for grace and mercy in the moment. Please, please, I'll do anything. Please just don't put that Q-tip in my mouth. And it didn't really fare well because we did have to swab her mouth. But she sits up, and I'm thinking, oh, she's going to want grace and mercy for, for her sister. She's like big sister. She's going to want to say, you know, save my sister. God, don't make her go through that. But instead, um, she looks at Evelyn, and she says, uh, Evelyn's turn. Real, real matter of fact. And I'm just taken back. I'm like, oh, okay. So Evelyn's going to have to endure that justice in Eva Emma's mind. So it's just this grace for me, but justice for you mentality. And if we're being honest, guys, I think we're all a little bit like that. But... <laughs> But God isn't. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that God's value system is so very radically different than ours. Because God says it's grace for you, it's grace for you, it's grace for you, it's grace for you, it's grace for everyone. And I want you to look to your neighbor and say, it's grace for you. And, and then I want you to point to yourself and say, it's grace for me too. And we're going to see that continue in our next coming verses. So we're going to skip over to verse 9. Yes. 
When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So right here, the word accuser, it sticks out to me, and I have a question for you all. Who does the Bible refer to as the accuser? Yeah, yeah, Satan. He, he does just that, guys. He accuses us. He shames us for our past. He shames us for our sins. He, he loves to bring things up that we thought we were forgiven on or we thought we were over, and then he just brings them right back up. And, and, and it's to shame us. It's to make us feel bad again. And for me, this happened to me real recently. Um, I come from a, a narrative of shame. I was sexually abused as a child. So this thought of shame over my whole body was something that I lived with for a really, really long time. And I thought, you know what? I, I've gotten so much help. I've, I've dealt with this. I, I'm good now. I'm 37 years old. But about a month ago, he brought me right back to that same word, shame. I miscarried my fourth child. And he whispered those lies right back to me. Megan, this is your fault. Your body's not good enough. You weren't a good enough mother. You're not strong enough. And I spent the last few weeks in embarrassment, in guilt, in self-blame, and I came right back to that word that I thought I would never have over myself again, and that's shame. And, and when we do this to ourselves, we get in the cycle of shame that we don't accept what Jesus is offering. He's offering us love, and he's offering us freedom, but we don't think we deserve those things. And this narrative, it's not only toxic to us, but it's toxic to the relationships that we have around us. So at first, I just started taking all those accusations from the accuser. And then I actually started becoming the accuser myself. And I started throwing stones. I threw the stone of blame. And I said, you know what? If you would have just been there for me, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Or, or maybe if you would have just done this this way, it would have turned out differently. And, and then I threw the, the stone of resentment. Well, maybe if I wasn't so stressed out all the time and it's work and it's kids and it's this and then that, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So I threw that stone. And I just picked up stone after stone after stone. And I threw them at whoever was around me. And I thought, if you had done this or if you had done that, this would have ended differently. And, and, and maybe you've been there too. Maybe you've been taking accusations from the accuser for too long. And, and maybe you're constantly living with the pain of your past. Or, or maybe you know what it's like to be the accuser. And maybe you've been making snide remarks or comments or, or cutting things to the people around you, to your parents, to your significant other, for the things that have happened in the past. But when we degrade and when we shame each other, we allow the accuser to call the shots in our lives and not Jesus. But, but guys, there is a better story for me and there is a better story for you tonight. Because remember, guys, there's a blessing in the brokenness. Okay, come on, somebody, if you believe it. Yeah, there's a blessing in the brokenness. So we're going to look on to verse 10. Then Jesus stooped down again, or stood up again, and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. All right, guys, so it's, it's Jesus, and he's face to face with this woman. The temple's quiet. The accusers, they're all gone, and she's standing before Jesus. She's probably a little disheveled. She's probably got tears like welling up in her eyes. Her, her shoulders are probably hung over in shame. She might not even be able to look at him in the eyes. But when she's at her lowest, when, when she thinks, man, I have nothing else, did you notice what she called him? She calls him Lord. And, and I have a question for you tonight. Do you call Jesus Lord when you are at your lowest when you feel like you've lost it all, when your pain and your shame are too much, is he the one that you call out to? Can you find the place in your heart where Jesus can be your Lord then? 
And, and when we do, Jesus, he meets us there. He comes into the shame. He comes into the pain that we want to hide from everyone else. And he's able to heal us there. And he does it with kindness. He does it with love. And he does it with grace. And we're going to see that as this story continues by what happens next. Because this is what Jesus says to her. Verse 11. He says, that neither do I. Go and sin no more. So Jesus, he doesn't ignore her sin because sin is a big deal, y'all. If it wasn't, he could have just done detention, okay? He, the cross never had to have happened, but instead, Jesus, he loves this woman so much, he actually came to die for her sin. And, and through her faith in believing that he's her Lord, he forgives her. But he not only forgives her past, he establishes her future. Because listen to me, guys. Failure is not an identity. Jesus is. I'm going to say that one more time. Failure is not an identity. Jesus is. So I don't know who this is for tonight, but if you feel like you're a failure, I'm going to speak the same words that Jesus spoke over that woman tonight. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. And just like he did to the woman, he does it in broken marriages. He does it in abuse. He does it in stress. He does it in pornography. He does it in addiction, anxiety, depression, regret. She was given her true identity that day, and it began her new life in Jesus. And the same is true for you guys tonight. Jesus died for every kind of sin. Every type, there's not a sin that's too dirty or too gross or too big or too bad that grace can't cover. Because Colossians 2.14, it promises us this. He canceled the record of the charges against us it, and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Someone say, it is nailed. But you got to be able to receive it. And you got to be able to walk in it and then start living a life for Jesus where we allow the spirit to continually transform us from the inside out. And where, where we are, when we do this, we, are, we can be like the woman and we can say, you know what, there's a better story for me. A story without shame and a story where Jesus is my identity. And when we make Jesus the identity of our life, we are marked by two things. One, that is being with him, and we can be with him when we are in his word, when we are in prayer, when we are in quiet time just listening to him. And then the second is becoming like him. We do that by practicing his teachings and practicing his ways and allowing the spirit to transform us. So I want to close tonight with practicing his ways together. And so I want everyone in the room to close your eyes. And I want you to make a fist facing down towards the floor. And, and as you make that fist, I want you to imagine your stone. Okay, that stone that you've been holding on to for far too long. Maybe this stone has to do with yourself. Something that you're, you're just not letting go of. Okay, something you can't seem to kick. It, maybe every time you... you, you you do it, it just keeps coming right back up. The pain and the embarrassment, maybe it's an addiction. And, and, and every time you think it's, it's going past you, it comes right back. And you just feel like you're unworthy of love because of it. If that's you tonight, I want you to breathe in the spirit. And then I want you to drop the stone. Or, or, or maybe your stone has to do with your significant other. Something has happened in your past. There's been trust that's broken, but you keep bringing it up and you keep throwing that stone on them. Breathe in the spirit and drop the stone. Maybe the stone has to do with your mom or your dad or your sister, and you've been holding on to something for far too long. Maybe it's from your childhood. I want you to breathe in the spirit and drop the stone. Because whatever your situation is, you can breathe in the spirit and drop the stone. So take a minute and release all the pain and all the shame and all the uncertainty to God and breathe in the spirit and drop the stone. With eyes still closed, I want you to raise every hand in the room with your palms out and, and, and facing them up in a posture to receive. 
I want you to receive the truth that God has already promised you from the beginning. These are things like grace and love and truth truth and mercy and and freedom and abundance more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And I want you to receive those right now from God. And as you do in this moment, I want to read to you the most repeated verse in the entire Bible. It says this, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. That description of God that we just read, it's actually how God describes himself to Moses in the book of Exodus. And the reason it's the most repeated verse in the Bible, it's because the biblical authors, they want us to understand God's character and that God by nature is love and that God by nature is grace. Now I want you to open your eyes. Look at the stones on the floor. Those stones don't tell your story anymore because Jesus is your story and there is a blessing in the brokenness. Father, we just come to you tonight. Our stones are on the ground and you're in front of us. And we just ask that you take away the parts that feel shamed and the parts that feel pain. We ask for a new identity like that woman received. God, she received a new identity in you when she called you Lord. And God, we're calling out to you right now. We call you Lord. And we're asking for you to come into the places that we think are too broken because we know with you that's not true. And so we ask for the accuser to to get behind us, okay? And and for us to continue to seek you and to seek your face and, and all that you are, God. I ask in the upcoming weeks that we will be able to just let go of some of this pain and this shame that we've been holding on to because there is a better story, a story that you have written for us and a story that includes you as our Lord and you as our identity. So I pray that we can walk in that and walk in your promises. We love you, God, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.